Great. Um, so Zahira, do you want to give it a start by introducing yourself and your journey into biohacking? Yeah, sure. Gosh, I mean, where to start? Um, can start at the beginning. So, I mean, I was born and raised in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Um, I came over to the UK when I was 14 years old. Um, so I was used to being at the beach every weekend and then coming to the cold, it was a bit different. And uh, then, you know, went to school, college, did A-levels, MBQs in beauty therapy, uh, then moved on. Well, I was going to go to university. I changed my mind. And then I started working for the government for about eight years uh, as a tax woman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I had to leave that place because it was so negative. And then I went into personal training. And then that's when I realized from you know personal training that there's a lot of misinformation and I wanted to do my own research because it just got feeling it didn't make sense. And I think that's really where my biohacking journey really started, probably in my early 20s. I think mm -hmm. that's when I went into it. So I'm 32 now, so ne nearly a decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, it's like we've probably been doing this all along but we just never knew that there was a term for it of biohacking. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it only got into the Cambridge Dictionary a couple of years ago after Dave Asprey made it a thing. And it's mm. it's probably something that people have done for a hundred or maybe thousands of years, but it wasn't yeah. just a thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So what about your journey? Uh, so I'll start by saying we're the same age, but I'll say we're on the same chronological age, and I have a feeling we're probably the same biological age as well. So we age. <laughs> but uh, yes, we're both thirty-two. So um, I, I think for me it was uh, first the spiritual path that led me into biohacking. So I took mm. a bit of a detour, uh, exactly like you. You were into tax, into corporate. I also uh, had a corporate life uh, before. I was um, a lawyer in the city of London, working really tough hours. Uh, learned so much in terms of intellectual rigor and perhaps the sort of geeky, nerdy side that has led me into biohacking was also comes from my background as a lawyer. But I had a sense of personal dissatisfaction and mm. I think it was twofold. It was not only the workspace, um, it was the office environment that had a lot to do with it, but also the disconnection from nature, uh, living the city life. And um, because of the workload, and social life and everything else there was very limited um options for you know weekend in nature or breath of fresh air and being raised in france in the south of france um i think the little girl inside me that was used to running in nature running in the forest was just really crying out loud yeah. and took a stand and decided to leave the corporate world, um, took quite a radical journey into Bali uh, mm -hmm. to learn yoga and meditation. And I spent a few months in an ashram in India, learned about circadian rhythm and meditation. And then following from that, I became more and more aware that there was a lot of misinformation when it comes to nutrition in the field of spirituality. And I feel like uh, a lot, and that's not, to speak bad of any of my yoga teachers or any of the yoga school I spent time with. I absolutely love them and learned so much from them. However, I felt like there was a lot that could be improved in terms of the nutrition information that was given. And there was this trend that veganism or vegetarianism was the healthiest thing you could do. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually damaged me, I would say. I, I yeah. was a vegetarian for many, many years, tried veganism, didn't do a lot of good uh, for my hair, my skin, my general health and wellness. Mm. And that really, I think, is the trigger for me going into biohacking was, was nutrition, was how can I hack my, mm, my nutrition to be at my peak performance all the time? Why do I have brain fog? Why do I feel mm. fatigued even though I've eaten you know, my meal or two meals? And then I discovered fasting and realized, well, actually, 
the less I eat, the more energized I feel. How do you explain that? <laughs> and <laughs> so just roundabout journey, but that was really the beginning of the biohacking journey for me. Yeah. It's funny that we have so much in common. You know, we've been apart all these years, but there's just so many paths that sort of link us together. Because, uh, you know, um, we, we have spoken once previously, and uh, as you know, I was also down the vegan path for a couple of years. And I could notice, although energy-wise, I felt quite well on a vegan diet, I must admit, I'm not denying that. But I did notice, like, my hair thinning a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that was, I think, the main thing that I, that I realised. Energy-wise was okay. And then I felt hungry a lot more. I'd say on a vegan diet, I just didn't feel quite satisfied. Um, so, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, the way I see biohacking for me, I've associated, you know, it's like skin types. Everyone mm -hmm. has a different skin type. What works for one person doesn't work for another one, you know. So some people might be completely happy on a vegan and vegetarian diet, but it just didn't work for me as well. And I think that's what the whole biohacking side is about. You know, it's not one fits all. We need to really find out what works for us individually. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. And I think when it comes to dieting as well, it's the same thing. Um, and I, I'm sure it's the same with you, but one thing that I love about biohacking is the, the mix of, uh, you know, of course, there is the element of gadgets and toys and tech mm. coming straight from the Silicon Valley. And we are using <laughs> some, and I know you love them too. Uh, and it's amazing because we do live in a world that is filled with technology and we cannot deny that. However, I feel that at its core, biohacking is about going back to the tools, going back to our human nature, mm -hmm. and going back to connecting with Mother Nature. And that's where the sort of spirituality twist comes in. Um, and when it comes to the diet, I also think that a lot of the reasons why I was a vegetarian for so many years, and I would love to hear your, your, your experience about that, was because uh, I do consider myself an animal lover and I think I had a lot of em empathy towards animals and I thought there was, you know, this bond and, and this mm. idea that I didn't want to hurt any yes. other being. Um, but it's all based on emotion and I feel like a lot of vegetarian or vegan campaigns and, and documentary that are actually factually very erroneous are all based on emotion and we mm. all have it, this emotion inside us nobody wants yeah. to see a rabbit get hurt or and you know of course i resonate with that but i do firmly believe that you can integrate a little bit of you know healthy fish healthy meat grass-fed um cow and wild-caught fish and be an animal lover i don't think yeah. that it has to be either or mm -hmm. do you resonate with that as well on 100%, 100%, absolutely, because I think that was the main reason I became vegan in the first place. It definitely was more because of the ethical reasons. You know, I didn't want to be a part of the mass production and the disrespect that there is, uh, you know, to animals. And I think a lot of fast food is definitely to blame for that. You know, they when it's just coming quick 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 animal after animal after animal they're just not treated like living beings anymore mm -hmm. it's just so robotic for them and i think we need to really step away from that mm -hmm. and although i think nutritional wise we are built to consume you know uh, animals and fish and things like that our digestive system and teeth is sort of proof that we can consume those. Um, where was I going with this one? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think we need to go back to how we started, you know, mm -hmm. as if we were hunter and gatherers again. You know? Absolutely. Have the farmers, I mean, I think I'd be terrible at farming and killing the animal myself, um, <laughs> but I'd like to you know, be in connection with people that respect the animal, they will, you know, 
when they are going to take the animal's life, it's a sacrifice for consuming, you know, the meat for our needs, you know, make sure that we are grateful, you know, for it. I really want that spiritual connection to nutrition, you know, like we are blessed to have this animal. You know? Absolutely. You know, I think that is what's missing a lot from our nutrition as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love that you mentioned that because I think gratitude in general is one of the biggest biohack. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings out so much positive vibration and, uh, and biohacking is very much about not only the physical realm of thing, but also the psychological, the emotional realm and just a general better mindset and, and being grateful for meal being grateful for food that we can eat being grateful for moments that we can spend on nature that surrounds us is i think a massive first step towards uh towards longevity and health and wellness um so absolutely i love that you mentioned that <laughs> yeah yeah um, that's good well um, what would you say in terms of um skincare and in terms of beauty how, how would you say that biohacking has sort of change your approach to thing or your favorite go-to tips for skincare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where do I start with this one? So I think um, for my own self, there's not much that I actually do. You know, people always asking me, oh, what do you do for my nails? Uh, what do I do for my skin? I'd probably say for me, less is more. Mm -hmm. It works. That's what works for me. I think my skin and nails probably comes more from my nutrition rather than putting products on. I say I hardly ever wear makeup. Hardly ever. <laughs> <laughs> when I do, I only wear organic makeup as well, which I think makes a big difference. You know, I don't want to be putting any harsh uh, chemicals on my skin or anything like that. And when it comes to skincare, again, I do only choose organic natural products like Alitura Naturals, things like that. Um, also, um, Ageless Glow, you know, she's got a wonderful little business and everything's handmade and natural. Um, things like that. I don't go near chemicals at all when it comes to my skincare. And also, I try... Um, well, I look out for labels, you know, whether there's no testing on animals, things like that as well. So mm -hmm. I do get most of my products, I'd say, vegan when it comes to skincare. Because I think that to me is a necessity. Um, you know, that to me is a luxury item, you know, to be putting things on your skin and clothing. So that side, I still stay ethical on that level because it's not a necessity for the out outer i say um what, what are your thoughts on that one um so i would say that actually uh a bit like you for me nutrition is the most important hack when it comes to skin i used to have pretty intense skin issues blemishes uh acne at an adult age which was very uncomfortable and really really uh, was bothering me uh, and I found that what really changed uh, was uh, increasing my intake of collagen on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so what I usually source it from is I make bone broth. I've started to make those myself. Yeah. Um, and that's part of my uh, sort of philosophy of eating nose to tail. So if I'm going to have, you know, um, ribs from an animal mm -hmm. or I'm going to have uh, any, any piece that has bones, then I will keep those and I will... Um, boil them for a very long time in a slow pressure cooker mm -hmm. and I find that drinking this broth has made my nail grow so much <laughs> on my hair and my skin um, so I completely resonate with what you're saying less is more um, mm -hmm. and the other thing that I've been trying to do is actually go by the philosophy which is not always possible but as much as I can if you can't eat it don't put it on your skin in the sense that your skin is your our biggest organ and it absorbs everything. So in the same way that we eat the food, I feel like we also, you know, sort of get in, get everything from the skincare into our bodies. Yeah. Um, 
So I always ask myself, um, would I, you know, is this, is this something that is genuinely good for me? So I found that using a uh, hazelnut oil um, around my lashes uh, has been really, really good. Um, using rose water that is really pure, um, using coconut oil, mm, she butter as well for my body. And just going back to almost those grandmother's recipe that we, you know, learned about and heard about, but we thought it was old school or, yeah. <laughs> or cliche or not fancy enough. And I think that there is a lot to be said. Um, mm. I do drink a lot of coffee. I mean, a fair amount of coffee. <laughs> uh, so what I do is I use the coffee beans from after I made the oh, coffee no. as a natural scrub. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, good. I really like this. Uh, and it just gives me that extra pleasure when I cannot have another third. <laughs> you know, if I can't justify a third cup, I'll just go and have <laughs> a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, gosh, too much coffee. Honestly, <laughs> I... I only started, well, for the first time I had coffee, I was 30 years old. Really? I had my first coffee, yeah. Well, okay. Because I've just felt like I don't need it. You know, I'm always quite highly energised. And I know if I do have a coffee, I definitely can't have it later than probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon. If it's any after that, it will disrupt my sleep, for sure. Mm. <laughs> I'm so like perceptive to it is quite funny really <laughs> well i think that the fact that you mentioned that just leads us uh, quite nicely into the idea of maybe uh being more conscious of not only what you eat but how you eat because i found that mm. one of the uh, major thing that sort of changed my life with biohacking was uh introducing intermittent fasting mm -hmm. um and so when we're talking about morning routine um I used to uh, run, you know, to work, sort of eating that sugar-loaded uh, cereal bar oh. and <laughs> had plastic wrappers. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm guilty of that. You know, I've been there, I've done that. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I genuinely don't do at all anymore. I'll have, um, I'll wait for a little bit when I wake up. I'll have lemon water, then I'll have a mm. cup of coffee. I might have a butter coffee, a bulletproof with collagen. But I won't have breakfast. I will definitely not eat until lunchtime so that I get into a longer fasted period after I've woken up. And mm -hmm. that's just a little tip I wanted to share with, with everyone tonight because I feel like if you're new to fasting, skipping breakfast is quite easy because mm -hmm. um, you don't have to wait that long for lunch. Yeah, um, yeah. I completely agree with you, actually. And I love having lemon water in the morning. Mm. How amazing does it feel? It feels like it's so clean. I, I love doing having lemon water in the morning. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, I, I have mine a bit warm as well. Do you have yours warm? Yeah, lukewarm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I find that um, it really is one of those routines that sets you up for success. Because the likelihood of eating badly after you've started your day with lemon water are quite slim i think mm -hmm. that it just puts you in that mood where you know you're going to be good today <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely and i think as well you mentioned about the intermittent fasting it's incredible um i mean one of my biggest i don't know if you want to call it concerns or it's the thing that i focus most on is the circadian rhythm you know, in general. And I think intermittent fasting really links into that as well. I mean, I think most people just associate circadian rhythm with sleeping, but it's just so much more than that. You know, like um, if you're going to be eating too late, then that's going to affect your sleeping as well and your circadian rhythm. And again, if you do fast, you know, eat later on, um, it's just amazing. It, there's so many benefits to fasting. I mean, mm -hmm. I started mine when, um, well, for spiritual reasons, when I was Muslim. And I used to do a whole month of fasting. And, you know, but after that, I've just still stuck to it. I don't, I wouldn't say I do it every day. I'd listen to my body. How, my body has a way of telling me if I need a bit more detox or you know sometimes depending on the cycle of the month where i'm at i might need to consume more food so i do listen to my body a lot but i definitely do a lot of intermittent fasting i say and it comes naturally as well 
it, it doesn't feel forced at all. You know, like, I'm, I'm not looking at my watch saying, oh yeah, I need to break my fast now or I need to start my fast now. It just happens, you know, naturally. Yeah, and I think I, I love that you mentioned all of that because I feel that uh, sometimes the pushback I get from people that I talk to about my hiking uh, for the first time is, oh, it's so fancy and expensive. And I think there is a bit of a mindset that, um, you know, it has to be uh, a very, very expensive way of living. It, it mm. can be, of course, I'm not denying that. A lot yeah. of standards and things are quite an expense. However, I feel that, especially with intermittent fasting, you become more in control of the quality and the way you said less is more for, for mm. beauty product. I feel that less is more for, for food as well. I would rather have it not only less often, but, but much higher quality. So mm -hmm. um, talking about, you know, meat or fish, I, I only buy grass fed um, meat, which of course is more expensive than if you take, um, any other grain fed meat but the quality of what the animal has eaten is going to lead to the quality of how the meat is and mm. uh, so that has a knock-on effect and I feel that a lot of things that we can buy sometime uh, from the industrial commercial um, consumer consumerism mm. um, society is quite expensive those cereals bar wow, those so-called health drinks can we talk about that for a moment because I cannot believe how much sugar there is in those. I'm not going to name the brand, but guys, everybody listening, if you're taking those drinks when you have a workout, you might want to rethink that. Um, I feel that they should not be allowed to be labeled healthy. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I was quite shocked to hear that. I think in the um, British health system, they actually thinking of bringing in these diet companies again not mentioning names to actually be prescribed by gps like by doctors and i was like these are all like ready-made meals with so much rubbish in it i just can't believe that's what they're planning on doing it's shocking to it's me. shocking how much uh, how much we can get fooled by by shopping in in shop and if we don't switch that sort of detective mindset uh, mm -hmm. and navigate throughout and i think um clients sometimes ask me but so what if i don't know how to read the labels and i don't know all those e uh, additives and those colorants and i think i would love to hear your your take on this but my piece of advice is well um if it's wrapped and you see a list of more than five things, you might want to ask yourself, what are all those things? Yeah. And whenever possible, and I know it's really hard in the modern, modern society that we live in, but buy things that are unprocessed yeah. and cook them. Of course, cooking is a form of processing food, but um, we've done that for a million of years and that's how we evolved as the human that we are today. So just buy the vegetables, buy the meat, buy the mm -hmm. fish, buy the fruits and the seeds, the herbs and the spices, make sure you don't use industrial oil or added sugar, and then bring you on. And, you know, also the pushback that we get on, oh, I don't have time. Yeah. How much time does it really take to fry two eggs uh, <laughs> in, you know, butter or ghee or coconut oil and to put together like a half avocado with some flax seed or to mm. just get a piece of ham or a grilled steak is you don't need to be a fancy cordon bleu chef <laughs> uh, to put together yeah. a nutritious meal yeah i 100 percent agree and two things that you mentioned about people complain over um price and time but i think it's all about perspective because can you really put a price on your health and also time by eating these you know rubbish stuff you're cutting down your time oh. on this earth for sure so oh, you need to think about it the other way around you know change the perspective you know it's worth investing in good quality products and then i really do believe that you make a vote with your money you know if you are always buying these 
you know, bad quality products, you're investing in that company, they're going to carry on doing it. If mm. you refuse to buy that and invest in good quality products, put your money in the farmer's pockets, you know, that will see that business boom. And we need more of that. Absolutely. And, and there is, I love that you said that. And I think uh, there is also the social aspect because especially in this time of so-called social distancing, um, I won't go into this subject, but I just want to say, I feel like, you know, we're trying to be polarized all the time and divided and, and not bond as, as we are meant to. I feel like, you know, going out to that local grown farm, going out to that local butcher, going out to the local uh, market is really going to reinforce the little bond and the socializing mm -hmm. and the and the mindfulness because you do make your shopping uh, and you can make it an enjoyable event mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and you can really sort of um, appreciate and, and find it, yeah, make it an event, plan it as, as, as an outing. Um, and I think it's a shame to see so much wrapping and, and again, going back to, um, to plastic consumption, the other problem with processed food is not only what's inside, which is, as you said, toxic, just poison for us, but also what they're made out of, which yeah. is complete wrapping. poison for the planet. I know. The wrapping is awful. It's, oh. I just can't even explain my frustration on the unnecessary wrapping and the damage it's doing to the environment. It, it's ridiculous, you know, and I think if we bought, you know, local food as well, you know, not go, you know, overseas and importing, you know, just stick with seasonal organic foods, local grown, we can cut down on the pollution, cut down on the unnecessary plastic, because that plastic isn't going anywhere except for on our earth again, and it's destroying the soil. And then our soil and insects are in so much danger, you know, and the minerals and vitamins in our food is getting lower and lower. And in a sense, that's why sometimes we do need to supplement because it's, mm. the food isn't containing it enough anymore because we're destroying everything, you know? Yeah, and, and from a biohacking standpoint as well, eating seasonal um, really helps with uh, just uh, vitality and energy because you're sinking yourself to the, to the earth, really. Mm -hmm. You're eating whatever is provided around you, whatever is meant to be eaten around you. And uh, you can really thrive from that yeah, um, yeah. so I think that's a really uh, really important thing to talk about <laughs> I mean I've been making a lot of effort you know to use everything reusable recyclable you know I don't buy any more plastic no more plastic shopping bags I always carry it's like a little potato sack bag I call mm. it <laughs> carry one of those and I have material cotton bags you know to put my loose you know fruit and veg in and even when it comes to my women uh, products, you know, like Tampax and sanitary towels, I use reusable ones that I can put in the washing machine and reuse. I mean, for one, it saves me a load of money, but two, main thing is the environment as well. You know, so I am, you, you know, taking it to a whole other level when it comes to, you know, recycling and the environment as well. Of course, we can all make more of an effort towards that. And, and when it comes to food, there is so much waste and so much that goes just, you know, towards damaging the planet. So, yes. yeah, it's, it's great to become more mindful. And I think, I think just going back to the essence of biohacking, you know, it can, it can sound like a mouthful and there is a lot of, I think, mystery uh, around it, but mm. it, it is... I think a lot of it boils down to becoming more aware, becoming more conscious as a human being, because that's really our superpower. Mm -hmm. It is our consciousness. So I believe that if we become more self-aware, we raise our vibration as a human being, we become more aware of our surrounding, more aware of our planet, more aware of ourself, mm -hmm. uh, more aware of our thoughts, more aware of our bodies, our emotion, and which is you know, radiate health and happiness. I think that it's really hard to say, okay, there is this line, 
one is physical health and the other one is mental health they're like yeah, you know together that's how they work um and to me that is really the essence of biohacking is sort of taking a 360 degree of your life and looking at everything where could all those toxins come from i'm talking you know what you eat what you breathe what you touch but also your relationship you know i think that you need to be super mindful of toxicity and we tend to think oh toxic we we have the usual suspect you know alcohol cigarettes but mm -hmm. we we overlook a lot of hidden suspects yeah um true. the sound i find is 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 a massive Polluent. We are po we are constantly um, stimulated with uh, digital sound and mm. with tapping and and alarms and notification uh, because we live in a digital world. And I would love to know your thoughts about that. But I found that my personal biohack or remedy against that noise pollution is forest bathing, going into nature mm. and listening to the sound of nature, which really actually switches on your parasympathetic nervous system. I know it may sound a little bit woo-woo, you know, spending time listening to nature, but it's been proven scientifically mm -hmm. when you do spend time in a forest or next to a tree listening to birds, um, your, your parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for your rest and digest mode, literally switches on and your sympathetic fight and flight uh, nervous system um, sort of switches off. So it's is it spiritual yes but is it also something that can really hack your wellness absolutely absolutely yeah yeah like i don't think people realize there is such a thing as nature deficit disorder mm. you know and that's not spoken enough about and it really is linked to depression anxiety hormone imbalances sleep deprivation and it's all due to not having enough nature and you know it's the most simple biohack you can do it really is you know going outside getting fresh air walking barefoot getting grounded mm. hugging a tree getting that energy and you know releasing also your negative imbalances into the ground get that recycled you know so 100 percent, everything that you're saying is <laughs> perfect um, yes <laughs> yes likewise i i really resonate with everything you mentioned about about nature and how people are missing it because uh I feel that we, we blame a lot of um, mental conditions such as depression uh, around, you know, uh, stress factors. But yeah. instead of thinking about what we can remove, sometimes we forget to think about what we can add. Yeah. It is hard to remove the job or it can be hard to remove the toxic partner in your life. Not saying it's impossible, but it can be hard. But as a first step, maybe you can think about what you can add you know you, you may not be able to quit your job tomorrow however mm. i'm pretty sure you are empowered and enabled to make the choice to take a stroll in the park breathe the fresh air take a moment for yourself tap into your breath work and really connect with the moment that you're present and that is in your power that is literally empowering you to do that thing mm. and um yeah i think it's a very important thing to think yeah. about i don't know about you but I have a checklist that I go through. If I don't feel 100%, I have a checklist. Like, I, I think first thing for me is food. I'll mm -hmm. think to myself, okay, what have I eaten? Have I eaten anything a bit off recently that might be giving me this feeling? Two, am I hydrated? And when I say hydrated, I don't even just mean, you know, water, because dehydration isn't just about water it's about your whole composition of minerals um you know and electrolytes so sometimes if i'm feeling off i'll make sure i take some electrolytes i put some hydrogen water as well i think the third one then is sleep i think have i had enough sleep sunlight have i been grounded and um if i've checked all of those and i'm still feeling off then I'll be speaking to my loved ones, you know, that I'm in close connection to. Like I'll be uh, 
Hi, how, how are you feeling? Because something's wrong with me and I've gone through my list. <laughs> I've got everything done, but I'm still feeling off. Mm. And I swear to you, a lot of the time, well, sometimes it has been the case where, you know, my loved one is feeling a bit upset over something and I can connect to that and feel it as well. Mm -hmm. It's such a powerful thing that people forget about as well as our, you know, personal connection to our loved ones. It also does affect as well. Oh, of course. Oh, and I think we underestimate the importance of intimacy and touch and play. And that's yeah. something that a lot of biohackers talk about, uh, you know, because we have this almost um, blame or shame around either playfulness or being a daydreamer. There is almost a saying, you know, in, in France, at least there is a saying, don't, don't daydream. It's, it's a bad thing. It's not productive. It's not effective. Um, <laughs> However, there's been scientific study that proved that daydreaming puts you in a mental state that is uh, very similar to a meditative state mm. where you're actually resting and resetting your thought process. Mm. Um, and you go into contemplation, you go very close to meditation, even if you're not aware of the fact that you're meditating and if you don't put mm. the label on it, that's sort of the brain wave that is uh, going on and 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 we stop that because we live in a society that goes by to do this and and be efficient and be productive yeah. and have targets and deliveries but you know i i love the list that you have and i would say that um, one thing that i've done very similar to what you have done is i have my list as well and i force it to be not a to-do list it's yeah. my to-be yeah. list because mm -hmm. for many years as a lawyer all i had were notifications on my computer back back in the days it was blackberries i am that old <laughs> <laughs> i was one of the dinosaurs using blackberries um and you know it was all to do to do to do what to do what to do monday to do this tuesday to do this wednesday to do this and mm -hmm. one of the biggest luxury in my life currently as as a wellness uh, wellness coach and as a meditation facilitator is to have to be list um, today, I want to be grateful. I want to be content. I want to be aware that I'm breathing. I want to be aware of my presence. I want to be joyful. I want to be giving. I want to feel abundant. Or I want to be abundant. Mm -hmm. And you just start on a daily basis to replace your to-do list by to-be list. And there is this mindset shift that's going to happen. And it's just a beautiful thing to witness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what um, resonated with me is when you said about, you know, daydreaming and mm -hmm. how people say it's a bad thing. But for me, I see daydreaming as part of my visualization. You know, mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my goals. It's like I'm visualizing my goals. I'm, yeah, I'm daydreaming about it and I'm going to make it happen, you know, and I'm bringing in the energy from the universe, you know, making this happen. That, that's what I think of about daydreaming <laughs> yeah i definitely don't see it as a negative thing at all uh, and it's yeah. not it's 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 one of the most powerful thing that you can do but we don't indulge enough in this contemplative state so i think it's a great thing to do and 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 becoming more grateful as we mentioned before is, is, is top of the list of the biohack that is uh free no, it's not it's not a fancy gadget that you need to spend uh, hundreds and hundreds and pounds on it's yeah. pretty accessible <laughs> yeah i know speaking of another uh free biohack what do you think about hot and cold therapy mm, i'm a big fan yes <laughs> So <laughs> I know you like your ice baths, right? <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, I love it very much. I love it so much. I actually took the Wim Hof from the mental course. Um, it was a complete epiphany. I, I'd never done it before. Mm. I went into the Wim Hof as a complete beginner in the sense that I hadn't built it up with cold shower. Uh, so I did what I recommend not to do. <laughs> now, whenever I have clients or people expressing an interest, I always say, you know, start by building up a practice towards cold shower. So every day mm -hmm. you finish your regular shower with a uh, 15 second cold water. And then the next day you're going to build it up 20 second, and then you build up to 30 second. Mm -hmm. um, and you build it up on a daily then weekly then monthly basis towards the three minute goal and then ultimately you're going to go into a nice bath 
I kind of fast forwarded the process, yeah. thought, okay, biohacker, here I come. <laughs> uh, I guess I like the challenge. And also prior to that, I actually had done the walking on a uh, cool. So oh, cool. I had experience being out of my comfort zone and I already had an appreciation that the limit was the mind. I, it wasn't the body. As long as you do it in a safe space with a professional facilitator, and of course, I'm not suggesting that anyone does it without supervision, but if you are facilitated and you are in a safe, safe space, the body is fine. What, what The block is in the mind. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you take an ice bath, actually it really goes hand in hand with breath work because one of the things that you need to do in preparation for going into the ice plunge is really uh, breathing in a way that will warm up your body and make you feel very present, very grounded before you go into the ice. And mm -hmm. during the ice bath, your body is going to scream, you know, get out and going to try <laughs> to get you out. Um, and what helps the most is just to connect to that breath and not going to a uh, hyperventilation and mm -hmm. not going to a shallow breathing, but instead just focusing on the exhale. Because if you lengthen the exhale, the inhale will also lengthen. So the inhale follows the exhale. So just focusing on lengthening the exhale and just being super conscious of your body, super aware. And also to just trust the body. The body is so wise. And I think... Mm -hmm. We now live in a, in a modern world where uh, we don't like to be uncomfortable. We are um, in constant search for comfort. Yeah. And that made us a little bit uh, lazy. I think that yeah. to become the superhuman that we all are, we have to tap into a little bit of being outside our comfort zone and being subject to things that are not necessarily pleasurable. We have become too much of pleasure seekers and instant gratification and, you know, sort of instead, I think it's good to go into more of a challenge mode and really mm -hmm. that's where the superpower comes in. And after the ice bath, um, you get a really nice reward, which is you have like a very, very clean natural high yeah. No substance, nothing used, uh, <laughs> but you just have this uh, euphoric, uh, exciting smile buzz and you just feel your blood and all your veins and it's, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I would really strongly recommend anyone that is listening to try it, give it a go. Um, and my top tip is build it up with a cold shower. Don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, because I, I, I think you're right in ourselves in general, especially our brains, the way it's functioning is we're always in survival mode. Or the, mm. You know, our brain is just always wanting us to survive and it's keeping us safe. That's its job. It's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go, go, don't go there, you know. And we need to definitely step away from that, I think, to really live for our full potential. Definitely, we need to shut our mind off sometimes. But, um, back to the uh, ice bath as well. I remember, you know, I remember as a child, I got into a really cold pool and I nearly drowned. <laughs> it, was, it was so cold for me, I couldn't move. It was hilarious. I mean, thankfully, my older sister got me out. But um, I'm not naturally, I'd say, great with the cold. So I go in saunas, I do uh, sauna, and um, I have had to have people sometimes, mainly my partner, you know, <laughs> shower me down <laughs> forcefully. I'm like, okay, okay, go, go, like, ah! <laughs> you know, has there been a bit of swearing involved, you know, whenever I've been in the cold water. But um, I was actually meant to be going to the Wim Hof, um what's the word i'm looking for um the fundamental course yes yeah, yeah i was mm -hmm. meant to go when he was coming to london in may and obviously because of all this palawa going on it's got cancelled so it's Another definitely trend. on my list of things to do so i'd love to definitely go on that experience but 
I'll try and build it up in the shower before. <laughs> I love that you do. I really think that it helps a lot because also what happens when you build it up. So um, now I've built it up uh, because I take the regular ice baths. So I'm the crazy person that, you know, buys the ice. And I've done it in Bali as well. I was ordering ice and I got this comment like, how much, how much cocktails? <laughs> I'm not making cocktail, I'm just taking crazy ice bath. <laughs> so um, you you can do it anywhere, but it's not very convenient. And I know it does take a little bit of organization, but cold shower is super accessible. You can do it everywhere at home. And the good thing is the more you do it and the more often and the longer you do it, because you're getting more and more exposed to cold, you're gonna grow brown fat. And brown fat is just, it's not just the fat that we think of when we think fat, because yeah. no one wants to be fatter, but you do want to grow your brown fat. Everyone wants to grow their brown fat. It's actually the fat that makes you more resistant to cold. And interestingly enough, although it's called brown fat, it does make you look leaner. Uh, and that's mm. another thing that uh, a lot of people don't know is um, ice bath is super powerful for weight loss or weight maintenance or um, injury recovery. So anyone that's looking to uh, tone down, get leaner, get a little bit fitter, it's a really, really, really underrated uh, tool. And I, I wouldn't suggest that that would be the reason why people go into that. I think it's about the <laughs> it's mindset. It's just a bonus, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a nice bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I think I need a bit more of a brown fat for sure because I do feel cold quite easily, I think. You know, I've not got much weight on me at all. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if you follow the BMI thing, which I don't really agree with, then, yeah, they'll probably put me as underweight category um, mm. but yeah i do need, i think i need to that's something i need to improve on for sure yeah i, need, mm. I definitely do i need to know that's, um i'm just thinking that um looking at comments and question uh so i'm just saying some comments about taking cold shower from sophia mm. that's really great to hear um so if anyone at this point has some question relating to ice bathing or cold or anything biohacking, mm. uh, which is coming close to our hour, so we would love to take your questions if you have any. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had uh, some really good questions by uh, one of my followers on my comments before, and I, I noted it down. So this is uh, the first question, which I think is really good. Do you have anyone who's inspired you the most on your biohacking journey? Mm. Uh, do you, you want me to answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go for it. Uh, so I would say definitely Ben Greenfield. Uh, mm. I, I love his book, Boundless. Um, this is not an affiliation. I'm not getting permission <laughs> to say that. <laughs> yeah. mm. I actually just think he's an amazing athlete. I. I love his approach to biohacking because he makes it so accessible. He's, um, I don't know him, I've never met him, mm -hmm. but through following him through social media and channels, I feel that personal connection. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of his um, tips are very genuine. So he's been a great inspiration. Um, Dave Asprey, of course, uh, I think he's been the one that I looked up at the most when it comes to the biohacking mindset mm -hmm. and uh, inspired my bulletproof coffee. Um, and I just love his persona, the fact that he has this, you know, Silicon Valley entrepreneur background. I, mm -hmm. I resonate a lot with his former uh, corporate mindset because that's also uh, the corporate mindset that I had. So I would say those are my top two. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I think I'm going to have to agree with you on those. <laughs> they are awesome. I remember the first time I even listened to Ben Greenfield. Um, you know, cause I've seen it, I've seen his face and then I heard his voice and I was like, oh, wow, I was like, he's got a really deep voice, hasn't he? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't know if you got that. But yeah, I think it's great with the information that he shares. I've got his book as well. I've got David Asprey's um, book, and I've had the pleasure to meet him as well. And he is a really great guy. And uh, one of the things that I really like about Dave Asprey is he gets asked so often, like, what is his 
biohack stack and he won't share it because he's like you know you've not got my history you've not got my dna you didn't go through the obesity that i did what works for me isn't going to work for you and i respect him so much for doing that as well you know you can see that he has this genuine concern you know for people's health you know he cares you know he could easily just say yeah take this and this and this same as me but you know it's not going to work so i admire them both for that for sure absolutely they're really really inspiring um so that's that's great um another question, question yeah, that i've got want... another one so mm -hmm. another one was how will biohacking evolve Mm. Where where do you see that one going? I see it going even uh, so. It, it's going to sound like a contradiction, but uh, I see it on the one hand going more and more into AI. Mm. I see, you know, I attended the biohacking summit uh, ten days ago that was um, broadcasted from Finland, and we talked a lot about uh, virtual reality. Mm. And how meetings are going to be all set up with a VR system, so you can you know, hear people from your right ear or left ear. And I feel like biohacker have a natural inclination towards gadget toys and technology. Yeah. That's the whole <laughs> hacking concept and where the words come from. So I feel like we're probably going to be. Um, some of the leader in terms of technology and new tech but at the same time I feel like they will be going back to nature more and more and that's where I see a bit of a conflicting contradiction because I feel like the deeper we go into AI which let's face it is happening AI is everywhere AI is behind big data it's behind the software the clouds the computer um, even just before I left my uh, career as a lawyer, I, I was actually working uh, in AI because we were working on software that was pretty much, uh, I don't want to use the word replacing, but most definitely uh, supporting the role of lawyers. So AI mm -hmm. is just everywhere, even in places we don't suspect. So there is this... Uh, going more and more towards uh, high tech, but I feel that at the same time, in Looking at this, there is a need for going away from screen time, a, a serious need from going away from digital lights, a serious need for going back to nature. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the more we use technology, the more important it is to go back to nature. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can find the balance. Mm. You know, I kind of love to see things progress in a way like, you know, next time when they're making mobile phones, like, have already like emf protection mm. or absolutely know, also like screen protection you know considering you know like blue blocking already you know inserted in gadgets you know so that we don't have to be purchasing these things separately and mm. i'd like them to be more conscious when they're creating you know these new inventions to bring it back you know make it more safe for us to use as well i think something like that would be amazing to see for sure yeah definitely i think there is more and more awareness towards uh, emfs and what they do to us but um it is also perhaps my hope that uh there is a raise of a consciousness towards mm. going back to a more ancestral primal mm. type of living so perhaps instead of gathering around a film at night and being digitally stimulated mm -hmm. Perhaps we can gather around, you know, a story or, you know, have a non-toxic candles because there are many <laughs> candles, uh, a non-toxic kind of fire or um, a natural light and just tell stories and, and, and have that human connection and have the human touch and just connect, especially when we live in times where there is so much social distancing going on. The few people that you can have in your household, if you're lucky to have someone in your household mm. then connect deeply with them as human being you know eye gaze with them breathe with them touch them feel them because um it's 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 really where our human nature thrives the most when when we get contact you know the hormones uh change we smile we are brighter happier 
And uh, I feel like we really need to tap into that human connection, uh, tap into intimacy and uh, tap into playfulness as well. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you, but I sleep so much better when I'm, you know, with my partner in bed than when I'm by myself. Mm. I can fall asleep a lot quicker because I'm just so much more relaxed and happier. You know, and having them cuddles is just everything. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I can't say that because um, having my partner by my side is a long distant memory. I've yeah. been single for a long time now. Um, but of course, yes, when, I'm, when I have uh, someone by my side, a partner, it's, it's always yeah it's always better to first sleep um but i feel like also it's something that um is it's a great point to mention because um you can get that social bond through friends you know pets or or you know it doesn't have to necessarily be in a loving partnership you can yeah. also have that human connection and that human bond through friendship um, and through, you know, your pets, and, and that's really exciting. So um, everyone can really thrive for that human connection. <laughs> mm. Okay, so there's just a question on here about yeah. what are both your takes on white noise? Going back to your earlier topic about listening to nature sounds, I struggle to sleep without the noise of the fan. Would you consider a non um, so I think when it comes to sleeping, the most damaging thing is really the light. Uh, so it's really important to black out. Noise, white noises, I know with babies, white noises are actually recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes some children also cannot sleep without white noises. I personally think that to be in a completely rested state, it's preferable to be in silence. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that if uh, it's a habit that you got into, a very nice tip to get out of it would be to set a time frame within which you're going to fall asleep with the white noise, but you're going to set it up to stop, say, mm -hmm. one hour. So you say you're going to bed at 10 p.m., you set up that device, and now there are many apps that would do that for you. You set up the app to do the white noise emission from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. And 11 p.m., you'll be deep asleep, and it will turn off automatically. Yeah. And you can sort of build up practice whereby then you do it half an hour, and then you do 15 minutes, and then you do five minutes, and then suddenly you get into a stage where you fall asleep to silence. Mm, yeah, that's a great advice. Me personally, sometimes I like listening to like um, a sleep hypnosis mm. audio. I'll have that playing for a little bit. It takes me into, you know, like a, a deep sleep and I'm, I'm done. But yeah, I pr personally, I prefer silence as well. I'm, I'm not really that keen on um, noise. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I, I love that you mentioned um, this guided uh, sleep because I think there are a lot of apps nowadays and recorded meditation that are really helpful. There is a practice called uh, Yoga Nidra. Uh, I actually have some recordings, so if um, anyone wants some of that, I'm happy to just uh, email anyone that attended this event. Yoga Nidra really puts your mind to sleep and they last only 40 to 45 minutes so you're not going to have the noise going all night long um, and if you're curious about it tonight you just type Yoga Nidra on YouTube and you're going to find many recordings. They're a really nice way to fall asleep. Okay, I think we only have maybe one minute left. <laughs> so <laughs> we might have to. I don't know if we're going to get cut off. <laughs> so. Uh, one last question, if we can squeeze it in, says define biohacking. So for mm. me, quickly, I say it is hacking your biology. Um, and for me personally, I think it's, again, taking it back to nature, ancestral, but using modern technology to do it. That, that's what Absolutely. I would say. <laughs> uh, yes. The uh, only thing I would add to that is really becoming aware and becoming in control of your inside environment. So your own biology, but also the outside environment mm -hmm. and understanding how you can hack it, meaning how you can modify, how you can tap into it to thrive and not just survive, to really become empowered to be uh, the healthiest person that you can be. So it's mm -hmm. all towards health, wellness, not only at a physical level, but again, as we mentioned, emotional, spiritual, and psychological. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you better say goodbye before 
Instagram shuts us down. <laughs> but yeah, it was great. Thanks for your time, Jackie. Oh, I love doing you. this event with you. And there's more to come. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to do another one because I know we still have so much to talk about. We have so much <laughs> that we haven't covered. Oh, all right. Okay, best wishes, everyone. Take care. Bye. Stay blessed. Thanks for texting. Yeah. <laughs>